Dr. Elizabeth Davis became the 12th president of Furman University six years ago. Previously, she received her Bachelor of Business Administration degree from Baylor University in Texas and earned her PhD from Duke University. After working for Anderson, Arthur Anderson and Company in New Orleans, she spent 22 years at Baylor in various positions, from an accounting faculty member to eventually becoming vice president and provost of that university. Under her leadership at Furman and with a $47 million grant from the Duke Endowment, Furman began the Furman Advantage, a special program that has students combine classroom learning experiences with experiences outside the classroom to prepare students for successful careers. Dr. Davis is active in the profession of higher education as a member of the Council of Presidents, which advises the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges. She's also on the Board of Directors of the Council of Independent Colleges. She's also quite active in Greenville with the Chamber of Commerce, Greenville Rotary Club, the Commerce Club, and many other organizations. She is listed in Greenville's Business Magazine as one of Greenville's 50 most influential people. She and her husband Charles have two children, Chad and Claire. And another little tidbit about Elizabeth, she and I share the same birthday, which is coming up soon. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Well, thanks, Sarah. I, I appreciate the invitation. It's great to see um, all of you still being active in OLLI, even if it's virtual. Um, what I thought I would do today is just share some thoughts of things that are going on at Furman and, and um, spend uh, a good bit of the time just taking your questions and hearing what you're interested in. Um, of course, just like you all are doing, we had to make that uh, quick pivot back in March um, to get our classes online and um, really figure out how we were going to deliver the firm and advantage for the rest of the semester. And, you know, I think back to that time, just how little I understood about um, the pandemic, how long it was going to last, what kinds of uh, challenges that we would be faced with. It was just so naive and now that it's become uh, a part of really our everyday life. Um, one of the things that, that we've done to prepare for this fall uh, is we have so many different groups that are working and planning and to continue to plan and assess um, how well things are going. Over 200 faculty and staff really were a part of and continue to be a part of our, our planning exercise. Um, <clears throat> many of you may know that when we brought students back to campus, we brought first uh, the first year's transfers and seniors and if you think about it, those students are on opposite, they live on opposite uh, ends of the campus. And um, typically they're not going to be in uh, the same classes. And um, the sophomores and juniors stayed home for three additional weeks. And that way we were able to figure out um, our protocols, logistics around uh, dining um, and just other activities that needed to happen on campus. Uh, fortunately, back in March, our um, chief um, technology officer, Dave Steinauer, realized that this was going to be um, probably uh, a, um, a long-lived situation. And so he ordered all kinds of new equipment for us to be able to update our classroom so that teachers um, and professors are able to teach both in person and remote. Uh, we let professors choose um, whether they wanted to continue to teach remotely or to be in class, um, physically present in the classroom. <clears throat> but we know that uh, 
not all students are going to be able to uh, be in the classroom all the time. And so we needed to have that capability to do both in person and um, remote at the same time. And because everyone in the country was trying to get, uh, whether it was document cameras or other kinds of remote um, uh, technology, uh, the last classroom was updated at 11.30 p.m. <clears throat> the night before classes started. So everybody has just been working like crazy to, uh, to be sure that we do the best that we can for our students, for all of our students, including our Ollie students. Um, we've been fortunate in our partnership with Prisma Health. So Prisma Health provides our student uh, health care as well as employee and staff, um, faculty and staff health care. And they've been an active member in our safe health and safety planning team. We actually have our own uh, epidemiologists on the faculty. We have um, the physician who is assigned by Prisma to Furman and a medical ethicist as well as others who've helped us make decisions around how do we bring students back? Um, how do we, what testing protocols we should follow in addition to using our own internal um, uh, folks, we've also relied on the state of South Carolina uh, and the protocols that they wish for us to follow as well. We did not test every student, uh, or at least the, the, the first years and the seniors when they came to campus but rather uh, relied on uh, the safety protocols, the mask wearing, the not gathering in um, large groups. Um, <clears throat> and really it was working quite well until we had uh, one of our fraternities had a couple of parties <clears throat> and it turned out that 60% uh, of those students were pos tested positive for COVID. So we decided that it would be best as we brought back the sophomores and juniors just to make sure that our <clears throat> um, health and safety was um, working as we, we wanted it to. So we tested every student on campus and then had the juniors and senior, uh, sophomores test before they came back to campus. And we had less than 1% of our on-campus students test positive. So um, we're very pleased with the protocols uh, and the way that our students have been following them. Um, we have spaces set aside so that we can uh, quarantine students and isolate them once we find out that um, they are positive or have been uh, within six feet of someone uh, who has had or tested positive for COVID. Um, our uh, master students in community health, community engaged medicine, they're actually serving as our contact tracers. And so um, they're getting real life experience working in this pandemic setting as they're also learning more about community engaged medicine. So <clears throat> we've, um, you know, we see this remote uh, opportunity, excuse me, as a way that we can increase our toolkit. One thing we know is that people who desire um, to come to a residential campus really wanna be in person. Uh, there were some folks who are a little worried that uh, once people find out they can learn online, they may not want to come to a campus like Furman, but in fact, um, students are thrilled to be back. Our faculty desire this kind of, um, education and so it's actually become even more valuable but one of the our, our faculty got really creative um, especially during the spring when they had to react so quickly uh, one of my favorite stories is um, a Spanish professor who was teaching a conversation class um, her students weren't going to be able to have the same kinds of experiences to engage in conversation, but 
uh, what she did was she connected them to her nieces and nephews in Mexico, and they were able to really engage in conversation with people their own ages, um, but who were native speakers. And then she even arranged for them to have um, an interview, an interview for uh, a job. And it, of course, it was a practice interview, but to interview in Spanish with uh, companies in Mexico. So our faculty really did get creative about um, giving students access to things that they might not have had before. Um, some of the other things that we did are, since the seniors in particular, the class of 2020, really didn't get to um, finish on campus, our Office of, of um, the Career Engagement reached out to every single graduating senior to uh, provide support and help in finding employment um, if uh, they hadn't already found positions. Um, and, and our internship office got really creative about finding opportunities for uh, students to um, to do virtual internships. So again, it was an opportunity uh, in a way that we were able to um, connect uh, our students in ways that we just hadn't done before. We're also finding that our alumni have been very helpful in finding opportunities uh, for our students. A couple of things that uh, we were able to introduce this year and get access um, or provide access for um, some high school students to engage with our uh, institutes. So we had <clears throat> an ac academy, so to speak, where uh, our students, uh, where these poor high school students had um, three weeks where they could learn um, different networking skills, um, uh, talking about life at college, but then they broke up into groups and one had a, a community-based medicine track that was led by folks through our Institute for the Advancement of Community Health. We had a sustainability track, which was led by our Shy Center uh, for Sustainability, and then an innovation and entrepreneurship track, which was led by our Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> and uh, that same innovation and entrepreneurship uh, group also ran for the second summer uh, a business an entrepreneurship boot camp, and it's designed for non-business majors. So knowing that the majority of our students are going to end up in some organization or business, um, and uh, it gives them the skills and the language that they need to jump right into business and, uh, and be effective. Um, We've had some great success uh, with fundraising recently. We really thought the pandemic was going to um, affect that really uh, quite a bit. But in fact, it was another year where we raised over uh, $30 million, um, which has been really a high mark um, and where we think we ought to be fundraising every year. We were excited to announce uh, a four million dollar gift from one of our trustees, Matt Wilson. Matt graduated from Furman in 1986 and he is a physician who lives in Memphis. He's been really great in terms of engaging our students, giving them opportunities um, to do internships with him, do research in his lab, and he's even taken, taken them um, to conferences where they presented papers together. And he made a $4 million gift that's to help um, continue to fund the Institute for the Advancement of Community Health. Um, so uh, other, we've had some great <clears throat> success with uh, the National Science Foundation. Uh, we received a million dollar award um, to increase diversity in STEM fields, and we received another 720000 to support students and lab equipment at Furman. We've also 
uh, received um, support from the Associated Colleges of, of the South. That's a group um, of 16 schools that, across the South from Texas to Virginia. Um, and that um, grant is to helping us to develop curriculum and other um, types of programs uh, to address racial inequality. Um, we've had some great news in terms of, of rankings recently. Uh, we were voted by US News most, most innovative, or one of the most innovative schools for a fourth year in a row, and really that's um, because of the Furman advantage and people know what we're doing here at Furman. Um, we moved up 13 spots in the uh, Wall Street Journal rankings and it makes us the uh, top ranked institution in South Carolina. And once again, we were included in the Princeton uh, Review's Best Colleges and Value Guides. Um, we were also ranked by them as uh, number 10 for best classroom experience and number 12 for most accessible professors. Um, one of the, the things that um, we do with our students and that we want, want to scale so it's part of the firm and advantage is called uh, Strengths Finder. It's a Gallup program where students um, take a test and learn uh, what their strengths are um, so that they really work from strengths instead of weaknesses. And the Gallup recognized Furman uh, with a Clifton Strengths Award and uh, wrote about it on our web, their website. So it was great for us to be able to get some publicity um, this way. I know many of you are disappointed that uh, we don't have any fall sports going on. I really have missed uh, the football games, uh, volleyball, uh, soccer, you know, those typical sports that we would engage in. Just one minute. Can you ask them not to blow? Sorry, I have people working around the house and it's about to get really loud here. Um, the Southern Conference voted to move sports, uh, the fall sports, to the spring. So we're trying to figure out how to do that um, to have still the full season so our teams can compete for championships. Um, I was on a call with the president yesterday and you know some of the folks are gonna have to figure out um, how athletes who play two sports and one's a fall sport and one's a spring sport, how they're going to be able to make that work out in the spring. But, um, you know, we had, institutions in the Southern Conference that did not want to play uh, this fall, just too many uncertainties and the testing protocols that are required. Uh, so as a conference, we decided to have a, the full um, season for these sports in the spring. Uh, basketball is, um, you know, we're really hopeful that uh, we're going to be able to play basketball, you know, a lot. As much as, as I hate to say this, I really am rooting for Clemson uh, and the other schools who are playing to have really good seasons so that we can uh, be confident as we go into the winter sports uh, that we'll still be able to play. We're thrilled, of course, that we were able to um, keep Bob Ritchie, you know, every year people are coming after him and uh, we know that one of these days a, a big offer will come, but for the time being, uh, we're delighted that he'll be staying to continue to coach men's basketball. Um, so really those are the, some of the highlights of the things that are going on. Um, I, I know we have, we're gonna keep maybe just 10 minutes for questions, but if it's okay, uh, Sarah, with you, let's um, go ahead and open it up uh, for questions and I can address more fully things that people are interested in. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, I know. Ms. Tavernetti said um, there was some thought that high school seniors would take a gap year rather than going to college. Mm -hmm. How did this impact Furman's incoming freshman class percentage-wise? Did we get the size class that we needed? 
We did not. In fact, that's why uh, you may have uh, read um, about the cuts that we made. We didn't, we knew the class I was coming in really starting in March um, was going to be a lot smaller. And what we're finding is not from gap years for us in particular, but the majority of our students come from outside the state of South Carolina. And we're finding the farther away a student was, the less likely they were to come. So we actually were uh, nearly 200 students overall uh, lower than we had budgeted for this fall. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, retention. Um, we had a small class that came in last year that was deliberate um, or smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and then the retention with uh, some of the students, again, from farther away who were in the sophomore years, uh, really made it, made it such that we're only at about 2,300 students when we anticipated being at 2,550. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered who pays for the COVID testing for the students? So when we did it on campus, uh, for our students on campus, we paid it for it ourselves. And um, we contracted with a, a local company who is doing the testing and could do it quickly and had enough people to be able to make it work. Um, the students, now, the students who uh, were part of the fraternity party, we didn't pay for that testing. We uh, had them, they all needed to get tested and uh, they, we charged all of that to the fraternity. Um, the students who were off campus, the sophomores and the juniors, they paid for their own tests. One of the things that um, we believe that we're going to need to do now that campus is denser is have um, more systematic testing. Um, and again, in terms of uh, the financial consequences, yes, it's it's going to be a lot of money, but not nearly as much money as it would be if students uh, had to return home again and then we needed to refund uh, the room and board. Is there any um, arrangement you could make with DHEC so that the testing would be free through the health department? So DHEC is just totally overwhelmed with mm -hmm. all of this. And in fact, whenever we thought way, way back when, it seems like forever ago, right, that it was just April. Um, but we thought DHEC would be able to help us, for example, with contact tracing. And they just, they don't have the manpower uh, to be able to do, to take care of the state, much less um, Furman. Right, right. Um, Kathy Knox wonders, um, what will the criteria be in order for Furman Lake Trail to be opened up for walking by the general public? Sure, that's a good question. Um, right now, uh, it's so critical. Now, so our sophomores and juniors have only been back. This is, I think, their second week of class. Um, it's so critical for us to keep the density down as much as possible that we wanna be sure we have our protocols in place before opening the campus back up to visitors. One of the things um, we know that as soon as it's opened up, we might talk about um, people just walking the trails, but they end up coming inside and using the restrooms and going to the bookstore. And those are all the different things that can uh, affect really the health of the campus. So um, we've, you know, poor students who had big weddings planned, for example, you know, that we're gonna have large gatherings by the bell tower. We just had to say, you can't, we're not allowing that. If it's small, we will. And we, the chapel is being used um, for weddings. But again, it can't be what some anticipated in terms of the size, so. Nancy Dixon asks, 
How are meals being handled on campus? Mm -hmm. So right, so one of the first outbreaks we had ha resulted from um, students sitting too close in the dining halls. And it wasn't big by any stretch, but um, we have protocols in the dining hall for students to be able to go in. There are a lot of different grab and go stations um, so that students can get their meals and then and then leave with them. Um, we've reduced the seating that's uh, in the dining hall so that students are spread out. So uh, I know many of you are used to eating in the dining hall. Even the faculty and staff don't get to eat in the dining hall. Um, it's strictly for students so that we can control um, the, the number of bodies that are in there. And rather than students serving themselves, the, uh, if it's in the dining hall or the um, paladin, uh, the uh, Bon Appetit workers are fixing their plates. What changes have been made in the library because of COVID? It really is just more about um, spreading people out and keeping the distance. Um, I haven't heard of any differences in terms of like checking out books or anything like that. Um, so it's really more about space. Um, you mentioned that the faculty were the ones that decided if they were going to have in-person or online only classes. What percentage of the classes did the faculty decide to do online only, would you guess? It's probably about 20%. Um, and it turns out that um, it's kind of concentrated in certain areas. So for example, all of, for some reason, all the accounting classes are online. Uh, certain of the sciences are, but then others are um, fully, fully in person. And that's pretty consistent across the country. I've spent a whole lot of time with other university presidents, uh, just as we were all trying to figure out, you know, how to handle all of this. And that's, that's really about um, uh, what other institutions are experiencing, at least the ones. Now, you have some systems who have just decided they're uh, completely remote. Um, uh, even like our, our colleague at Rhodes, Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee, is completely remote because of really what was happening in Memphis and the number of outbreaks uh, in Memphis. So they decided um, that they just needed to do remote the whole year. And, I, you know, I financially, although that can't drive everything, you know, those of you who understand how university finances work, it's those costs aren't all variable, right? The residence halls are there. There's, you know, whatever kind of um, debt that might have been used to, to build the facility still needs to be paid. You know, we want our workers to be able to be employed. Um, so it, it's really uh, a big economic hit uh, if the institution needs to, to shut down. Right. Uh, Dennis Tavernetti says, uh, another comment, I'm happy that the Furman Playhouse has figured out how to have performances for students on yeah. campus and going Zoom for Greater Greenville audience, who's not allowed on yeah. campus, and at the bargain price of $20 for the season. <laughs> I, know our, um, I know our students and our theater faculty are just thrilled that uh, they're able to, to make that work. Um, and I've talked to... Uh, some folks in our music department just trying to figure out will we ever get to have any concerts this year and, and um, you know whether that just needs to be outside. I know our band is practicing under a tent out right in front of the um, art building. Uh, so I've gone out and, and visited with them and um, you know people are doing their best to try to adapt. Um, given all the craziness. Creativity is impressive. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
Jan Tallman says, just wanted to congratulate you on Furman's high rankings again this year. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that we know um, is that students really do look at this when they're making decisions about where to go, um, where to go to college. And um, so we certainly um, are proud of the way that we're being recognized by uh, external parties. Those of you who know um, the firm, when Sarah said that I work for Arthur Anderson and Company, that's a was it's the one that went down with Enron, but I was a, a public accounting company, and I uh, was an auditor. Um, and one of the things that you know I think is really important is that third party validation that says this is a good place. Um, I'll say it's a good place all the time, but uh, when we can get a third party to say, you know, it's innovative, it's a, it's the value is there. That's certainly um, a little more credible than the president uh, saying it. <laughs> Nancy Dixon wonders, does a cleaning service keep the door, dorm sanitized or is that the student's responsibility? And how often is that accomplished? So um, in uh, the, the students would keep their own rooms um, sanitized, but anything else where there are shared spaces, uh, our cleaning crews have been trained in the right kind of um, cleaning materials, how often spaces need to be cleaned. Um, you know, we have those, if you've seen on TV or how places spray things down, you know, we would do that in any areas that um, uh, multiple people would, would be using. You know, so it's having the right kinds of products, the right kind of gloves, there's hand sanitizer everywhere. Now in the classroom, students are supposed to wipe down their desks uh, at the, you know, when they come in and when they leave. Um, it, those are the ha habits that still aren't quite totally uh, in place yet, but, um, but everyone's doing done a pretty good job with that. Have you been able to get enough of those kinds of PPEs, things that mm -hmm. cleaning supplies and sanitizer and so on? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was a little more difficult early on when places were running out, but we've, we've been able to um, keep up with that. What about auxiliary, I, that's not the right word, but other programs like um, mm -hmm. Bridges to a Brighter Future, are they still functioning? And if so, how? It's remotely just like you all are doing. Um, and uh, really a lot of the different events that we would have had that would be in Yacht's Conference Center, either they'd be remote um, or would just have to be canceled. You know, the. Uh, all of our summer programs that we run ran um, are typically run. Most of them were canceled, uh, except for like the virtual boot camp that I told you about. Um, the golf course, you know, was closed for a while, but now that's open following uh, the guidelines that the PGA has set up for golf. So um, everything programs, Sarah, like you're talking about with uh, bridges, um, we want to keep those. Uh, running in as normal as possible uh, for the benefit of those students. The summer programs are of income to the university. That must right. have been mm -hmm. a, a great cut in your um, financials. It, it was. In fact, um, this isn't uh, a secret by any stretch of the imagination, but we uh, had to close at the end of the last fiscal year, a $5 million deficit because of sending, uh, you know, refunding room and board. Ooh. But for this academic year, it was over 20 million. <laughs> yeah. And so um, some very difficult decisions had to be made um, um, around, I mean, you know, 
driving to men's sports. We had people that were on furlough. Um, if people weren't furloughed, then they took salary reductions. Uh, again, very similar things that were was happening across the country. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of income that uh, um, that we we just didn't have because of summer. And of course, the immediate um, concern around the endowment, right? When the market fell so far so fast, we were worried that it was going to be even worse. So, but we figured out a way to manage it. Do you still have people who are furloughed? No. And again, one of the reasons that we want to be open is to be able to keep people employed. We also know that some students just don't have access to the technology. Or if you think about um, what was happening back in March and April, you know, when everybody was remote, including, you know, not just our students, but maybe their brothers and sisters at home and the parents were having to work remote and not everyone, how many places really are going to have a computer for everybody, right? Usually there's one family computer if there's even one at all. Um, so it was very difficult for our students to learn the way they needed to in the remote environment. Um, so you couple the needing to learn, wanting to keep everybody employed, uh, staying open is really just priority number one. Staying open safely is priority number one. What have been particular situations for your foreign students, students who are from outside the United States? Yeah, so some of them didn't get to go home over the summer. So some of them stayed on campus all summer long, which was really pretty lonely. Um, and then uh, others, you know, again, trying with the technology. We don't have a large international population. Um, so, you know, but we do have some students who are out of the country who are having to learn remotely. And so think about the time change or the time differences because we want classes to meet at a particular time. Um, well, for some students, that might be in the middle of the night, you know. So, um, yeah, so there's, or uh, even students who are in California, right, an eight o'clock class, <laughs> that's gonna be a pretty, a pretty early class. Um, so there's just a lot of things, you know, that people are having to adjust to. With the few students you have that couldn't go back to their native mm -hmm. country, are there any things that Ali members can do, like uh, have them over for a home meal, or, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what you can do to help be helpful, but still be not breathing on them. <laughs> I know that's really the it of one of the risks, right? The ones who are here, who were here this summer, uh, you know, Bon Appetit delivered food to them um, every day, and our folks from Student Life checked in on them. But um, it was a pretty, pretty lonely existence. It's got it's better now, right? Now that there are more people back on campus. So, um, but we're really encouraging students not to um, really mix with, you know, with too many um, different people. So we keep that chance of getting sick as low as possible. Of course, we hope you'd always keep in mind if there are things that Ali members can do that mm -hmm. would be helpful, um, we're Absolutely. eager to help. I, yes. I know, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I think there's going to continue to be opportunities to help students thinking through, you know, career uh, choices. I know people have been, um, Ali students have helped the uh, college age students, you know, think through those kinds of issues and um, 
So again, it's just great to be able to have that resource that most places and most students would, would not have that opportunity. Hey, and Bob Coban ask, are classes recorded? Not usually. Um, what uh, a professor would do is uh, there could be like uh, narrated lectures or PowerPoints that people would put online if they were going to teach asynchronously. But typically when uh, the class is meeting, whether virtually or uh, in person, the classes would not be recorded. Nancy Dixon wonders, is the vegetable garden functioning? I don't know. I'm going to ask Charles, my husband's sitting right over here. Do you know if this Furman Farm still working? He doesn't know that either. He's our foodie. <laughs> yes, uh, we know so. that. We, we love <laughs> Charles and his cooking. <laughs> That's right. And it's been great. He's been cooking every, every day. We had gotten so lazy that, you know, it would be just easier to go out to eat or something. But I've been to great beneficiary uh, of his wonderful cooking. And he even gets out his own cookbook yes. uh, to, to follow his own recipe. So you tell, you tell him we, we get out of his cookbook too. <laughs> I love your cookbook. Um, Dennis Tavernetti says, is it possible or likely that after the virus is behind us, that enrollment will surge to help reduce that income loss of the past years? Um, I don't think it'll surge, but what we wanna see is enrollment of a different kind. Um, and so we're looking mm -hmm. to have more post-baccalaureate certificates or programs, mm -hmm. um, maybe a few more master's programs. The thing with the liberal arts college, and if you wanna deliver the Furman Advantage to every student, it starts getting difficult if the student body is too large. Sure. Um, but uh, especially Anthony Herrera, uh, who leads our Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, has been doing a great job uh, connecting with um, the businesses in town, with the entrepreneurial um, folks to really create other kinds of educational opportunities that can help generate that revenue. And really in the long run, um, that's going to be something that Furman has to, to grow. Um, I don't know if, if you've heard uh, of the enrollment cliff that is predicted uh, in, I think 2026, we're going to see a large uh, drop in the number of college age um, students. And it's really just following uh, birth records. Mm -hmm. um, and so to continue to rely on undergraduate only uh, or predominantly as a way to generate revenue um, can't be our only strategy. Right. Well, Elizabeth, our time is up. We appreciate you sure sitting is. with us. And well, uh, I wish I could have done it in person. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great seeing everybody, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. We do too. All the best to you. Well, thanks, and happy birthday in eight days, Sarah. You too. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs>